Okay, so on to build targets. And there's a little bit of an odd uh, chicken and egg situation here in explaining something that we want to explain. And, and I've already mentioned how in uh, Python you have this fairly direct relationship between, uh, most of the time at least, between your files and what is going on with the code and what is getting executed and how in C++ that can be a more distant relationship or it can, some, it can sometimes not even make sense at all. Now, you have source files and those can be, you know, headers, C, CPP, or you'll find them as CP, uh, CC, uh, HPP. So these are pretty much all the same file as in they're just plain text and it contains instructions. Uh, and then, and this is part of the chicken and egg, you can have libraries that actually contain functionality that you use and directly or indirectly fronted from a lib, you can actually have DLLs providing functionality. So I will say source wise, this is pretty much the situation for text source files. And this is pretty much the situation for binary source files. I'm simplifying a little bit, but this is actually uh, what you will encounter for most of your early time with C++. Actually, you can go a very long way without having to deal with any of these. Now, in the middle, of between that and your actual build, which is where you get an XE, a DLL, or a lib. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that happens. Things get pulled together into the project. Uh, they get built. They get built by the compiler. They get linked and so on. And this is where it's kind of uh, a little bit tricky to explain all of these without explaining what comes in. So we'll try for a simplified model. Now, the first thing that happens is that uh, the compiler stage will basically take translation units. And we're not gonna go into that, but basically several files, uh, like a CPP file with its header can become one translation unit. So several things are gonna permeate from your source into the world of the compiler, and the compiler will basically generate several objects. And these at this point are basically uh, binary objects and there's intermediates and all of that, but we don't care too much about it just yet. Now, if you have an external library of sorts, it is um, very possible that it's offering, uh, and let's say that this is represented inside an object here, it is very possible that your other intermediate objects or your objects that need linking, which is what we're about to get to, actually require that to exist. And that is why the compiler has to blindly uh, fetch and re several things and make several objects out of it um, and take the build's word on whether something is about to exist. So the DLL might provide services that your object might be using or the lib uh, or some other father, God knows what. And um, this thing will need to reference things that it knows nothing of. So that's the part when these dependencies need to be established where the linker comes in. And it might be, and this is um, probably for a beginner getting a linker error is one of the most dreadful moments because they're a lot harder to figure out unless you know about this, which is why I'm saying that I do believe that this needs to be told. Um, you need to at least have some rough idea of this going on uh, before you embark on C learning C++ uh, because a lot of the errors and issues you get are actually related to these and not necessarily to the programming skills you're still trying to acquire. So once this happens, and again, we're simplifying a little bit, but this is a perfectly valid model that can last you many, many years. This is what finally produces your target. And that target can be any of these three, XC, DLL, and lib. So, this is the process you need to know about. And again, I'm mentioning it because, you know, the chicken and egg DLLs and leaves can come in at this stage and be sources. They can also be what you want to build. Now, the probably most interesting and most straightforward is the exe. So to understand what an executable is, um, remember the compiler negotiates for you. You tell it what you want and the compiler does a lot of work to establish your intentions into the final bytecode. Um, into the actual opcodes get, get passed to the CPU and so on. So the interesting thing about the EXE is that it negotiates with the OS. Um, now, libs and DLLs and EXE, they are 
not different types of bytes or anything like that. They all contain CPU instructions. So what is the difference between these? The difference is largely how they interact with the operating system. And modern operating systems, we're excluding a lot of stuff. So anything that goes on in the kernel, if you write the operating system themselves, um, if you write drivers, stuff like that, a lot of what I'm about to say um, gets a little bit shakier. But as far as you developing your own Maya plugins or your applications and so on, this is pretty true. So the operating system is the only controller of the CPU, the memory, and a bunch of other resources, your hard drive and so on. So if you want to do anything, if you want the CPU to execute something, to copy memory, to do things, you have to ask the operating system for a process that you can sit in. And it needs to coordinate with other processes, multitasking, access to resources, and so on. That is what an EXE does. So when you have a build process in here, you need to tell the build what you want to build. And the code that's contained you know, might not change at all, but the way this target is built does change. So in the build, you're gonna choose one of these. If you choose to build an EXE, and this is the build config, and this is where CMake, um, make and CMake wrapping several makes and uh, the Visual Studio Windows equivalent, which is the solutions and projects we talk about, uh, introduce another element, which is the configuration. One of the things you will do is you are gonna choose what type of target. And if you choose EXE and your code is compliant, so it has a main or a win main or something like that, it has an entry point, what happens is that this thing is compiled in such a way that that entry point is available. So you would have a main in there. The operating system recognizes everything that it needs. It basically grants the process to the EXE when it executes it, provide, provided it doesn't have virus in it or something like that. And that is it. And you can now instruct the CPU and the memory to do uh, whatever you want. Now, if everything had to go into a single executable, um, that executable will get very unwieldy. And very often you want to use something that's external to that executable, uh, say some um, libraries that the operating system provides and that all executables have convenience in using, or you want to use OpenGL, an example, or a number of other things you don't want to include those in the executable all the time. You want them to be somewhere that you can load and use and you want the operating system and you don't want five different executables that all use the same library, uh, each of them having to load its own version. Uh, if there's a possibility that those can be shared and deduplicate that you want the operating system to take care of that. That is where DLLs uh, basically come into play. So say that your application actually needed to uh, draw into the screen and that screen is OpenGL so you want to use OpenGL uh, without going into driver negotiations and hardware management or something else now there's usually a DLL that will give you some services so it is very possible that some of the code that you need to run is actually provided by the DLL and the DLL is also going to be likely managed by the operating system so that's what a DLL is. It's a dynamically linked library. It's a library that provides functionality. It has very real code. It has export symbols uh, that you can call into and your code can call that. And that is why, again, the linker needs to know that at some point this DLL will be available, uh, whereas the compiler, which only dumbly looks at blocks of files to generate the translation units or from the translation unit domain, uh, we'll have to take the builds word that that thing will exist. So that's, that is what a DLL basically is. Now, if you're looking at the Maya plugin, so this is if you want to run your own XA, uh, there is a parallel for that. So if you are in Maya word, uh, that EXE, that is basically Maya. And that is provided by Autodesk for you to run. That EXE has a subsystem to load and run plugins. And that is how you pass your code into it. You tell the plugin system, I have this file and I wanted to register it and I wanted to call it uh, at the right time and I am providing such and such services. So the plugin system will have a slot. When you instruct it to load something, you might expect a couple functions which are 
uh, load plugin and unload plugin in example. And what if you're developing a plugin, what you want to give it is a DLL, right? So in that case, if you're building a plugin for Maya, your build target will not be an EXE, it will be a DLL. And you're doing source work. So it's not like DLLs are only a subset of what you do. Sometimes, especially if you're embedding, uh, if you're offering your services to a plugin system uh, to manage your code for you, that's when your main output is gonna be a DLL. Now there's one more case um, which you are unlikely to encounter early on in your career, um, but that you will need to consume and that's libs. So everything I said for DLLs, uh, offering code and services that you can basically uh, hook into or that you can offer it to something that knows how to hook into, pretty much all of it is also true for libs. So what is the difference between the two? In, the difference is dynamically linked. So this is expected to be found once the EXE is already running. The lib is statically linked. So your EXE will contain it. What does that mean? Now, you have your, let's get another color for this. You have your happy little OpenGL viewer that you have written. And you have a library of math operations that you like that you've wrote. Now, from your OpenGL viewer and from some other application, maybe even from your Maya plugin that you're developing, uh, you want to use the same math library. Now, you could make this into DLL and go to the trouble of uh, making sure that it's available to the users that will have your OpenGL viewer, that will use your OpenGL viewer or your Maya plugin. Um, beside performance issues and all of that, or you could decide, look, this is small enough um, that, and I want to reuse it enough without making it just text, just headers that need to be included. I would like it to be compiled, but I want it to be compiled in such a way that it can be embedded into my EXE here and that it can be embedded into my Maya plugin DLL here. So that's what a lib is. It doesn't exist and gets deduplicated. You know, it doesn't exist in uh, as a bubble in the operating system space and applications talk to it. It actually gets phagocitated by whatever you are compiling and becomes part of it. So you are unlikely to want to create the lib. Uh, if you're a beginner, you to create a lib that you are going to use in some other place, but you will encounter them because libs are actually super common uh, when offered with APIs. So these can actually go pretty inception-y. Uh, very often, uh, something like Mayan example will provide DLLs that offer services, but the interface that the programmer actually uses to include those DLLs, to link into those, is a small wrapper lib. So it is perfectly possible to actually have a lib here that actually grabs from a DLL and the DLL is pretty close source maybe uh, or it's pretty intricate and you might want to change it many times but you don't want to see you don't want your clients to see the changes that you do to the internals uh, very often libs are very thin wrappers they just wrap a DLL and help some other target to include what is in there now if this sounds intricate and complicated, don't worry. Um, we're going to go into examples. It's the only important thing is that you know that this exists and that you understand why there is that little bit of chicken and egg that you needed to disambiguate. But that's basically it. And this is why you actually care about the output file. So the next thing we got to do is talk a little bit about translation units and what the series files are and how they all combine into this, which is going to be just a small expansion of what we just discussed.